Ruth. Pleasure to have you in today. Um, I suppose uh, credit's just one of the major issues they're going to be looking at. Uh, the other one is jobs. We've heard a lot uh, about the concern about jobs, particularly in the public sector. And there was a report out uh, this morning about this uh, saying that about a third of companies expect that they'll be laying off people in the next three months. It's pretty depressing. Isn't it? Well, I'm not surprised in a way because I think the economy is not growing as, perhaps as quickly as we'd like it mm. to. But it, when you talk about public sector jobs, and we know that the, the OBR was forecasting quite a lot of public sector job losses um, going out to 2014. They've not started yet. I mean, the trouble is we're talking about austerity, we're talking about these public spending cuts, but they've not really started to bite. They'll only really start to bite next year and then going forward for the next three or four years. As the question really is, can the public sector, can the private sector fill that public sector gap and will they be able to employ people so that you don't see the unemployment spiralling out of control? Well, I think that's one of those $64,000 questions, quite yes. honestly. And it was interesting when you look at the OBR's forecast that they brought out, of course, the same day as the budget, the emergency budget on the 22nd mm. of June, the OBR was very optimistic that even though by 2015 you might lose as many as 600,000 jobs in the public sector, mm -hmm. nevertheless, the private sector would come and sort of like a, ch a cavalry charge, create 2 million jobs, and so you get an overall creation of 1.4 million jobs. I personally think there have been terribly optimistic mm. but I think what it does undermine is the absolute need for the private sector to be given every support to grow to prosper and actually create employment this brings us back though, doesn't it to this banking question because if they need to they you know this is George Osborne's idea his plan is to make them grow but they do need access to easy credit to do it and yet the banks are being told to be more cautious well I'm very very interested in this because I was actually looking at the bank lending figures mm. and I look at the the Bank of England's trends in bank lending which is a very useful document to look at actually and of course what has happened with the larger companies is that they've been cutting back on their loans but they've been raising credit in the capital markets so they've been raising funds in the capital markets mm. whether it's equity or bonds and they've actually been paying off the loans so of course it makes net lending look very 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 low in fact right. it looks negative yes. but even when it comes to the small businesses. I was looking at some figures from the BBA the other day, and even small businesses are paying off their loans out of their retained profits. So it, it really isn't quite as obvious as that. This looks terribly, terribly political to me, if I may say so. Right. Very interesting. Very interesting. Now, the other issue that we're going to be facing, we're going to hear a lot more about, is inflation. Adding into the inflation mix, we've also got the commodities prices yeah. soaring and concerns that they will, they will go higher with the floods. That then would put extra pressure, wouldn't it on Mervyn King to do something oh, about interest rates? I don't think there's any doubt about it. And of course, bit, uh, over the last few months, the bank has consistently missed its targets. It's consistently underestimated where inflation is going to go. We're still over 3% after all. We'd hope for some respite next year because, you know, the VAT increase of this year would have dropped out. But of course, it won't drop out now because the VAT rate's going up to 20%, so that'll another, another, add another half percent on CPI inflation. Yeah. And I think what we'll hear from uh, Mervyn King on, on Wednesday is that he expects inflation to stay really quite considerably above target for next year. The $100 question then is, is he going to say, oh, but in the medium term, in two years' time, we'll still hit our 2% target, therefore we don't have to rate interest rates. Will he say that or won't he say that? I mean, my view is they shouldn't be raising interest rates. They should just take inflation on the chin, if you like, and keep stimulating the economy as much as, it can, as they can do. They'll need to do that because of the austerity we've been talking about. Indeed. I mean, this is the big issue, isn't it? Is that, you know, can we actually afford to have increased interest rates while you're also cutting uh, the public sector finances. You know, would that lead, which is the concern, the, the overall concern, to some kind of a either a major slowdown or even a double dip? Well, I, I personally think so. I think it's, it's incumbent on the Bank of England now. In a way, and I'm not saying completely irrespective of what happens to mm. inflation. You must not ignore inflation, but it's incumbent on them to have very, very slight monetary policy. Keep interest rates low. If necessary, even more QE. I think anything to keep this economy going. And if they really start putting up interest, interest rates, what's going to happen to all these people who are overextended on their balance sheets? Mm. A point that the Bank of England was making in the Financial Stability Review. If they really do that, you could find more and more indebtedness, more and more hits on the bank's balance sheets. That's exactly what you don't want at this stage. So really, my plea to the Bank of England is please keep these interest rates low. Don't worry too much about inflation and let's have some growth in the economy. Indeed. Now, looking at what's happening with the, the currency markets, we've seen that the uh, dollar, the, the pound is actually, it's gone up really quite quickly against the dollar. I think it was 150 a few yeah. weeks ago. It's now 160. 160. And that is an issue, isn't it, for exporters because uh, Britain, again, will 
looking for strong export mm. figures. We saw Germany's export figures all doing very well when the euro and the pound were weak. And that's also potentially going to take a hit, isn't it? Well, it is, but it's interesting how, of course, I mean, what was it 12 months ago? I'm just trying to recalibrate my brain. But it mm. wasn't the, you know, the pound was, what, $2? Exactly. Uh, you well, know, and right, we, yeah. we've still fallen back quite a long way. Mm -hmm. And we're still about 120 against the euro. That's pretty, pretty low. That should really give British exporters quite a competitive advantage. But it's been interesting over the last few months that even though they've had this huge competitiveness boost by a weak currency, exports haven't done that brilliantly. Mm. I mean, manufacturing seems to have picked up, but the export figures, not so good. But the real question going forward is whether there are going to be really nice open export markets. Are there going to be buoyant export markets? Mm. Is there really going to be the demand for our exports? And you look at the States and you think, oh dear. Okay, Ruth Lee, thank you very much indeed, as ever, for coming in and joining us today. Thank you.